Okay, thank you for attending today's training session. The recording will now begin. Good morning, everybody. This is Lizette Figueroa, and welcome to day two, where we will go over internet self-response and the paper questionnaire. Um, my co-host for today, today's training is Luis Gomez, um, another partnership specialist. Um, together, we will go through um, the internet self-response and the paper questionnaire. As you know, right now, um, most households have received their invitation to go ahead and go online and respond to the 2020 census. There are three ways to respond. Um, in this portion, we will go over the online response guide as well as the paper response guide. Um, so please let us know if you have any questions in the chat box um, as we move forward. So specifically, what are the 10 questions of the 2020 census? A lot of people um, get, you know, always ask, well, I remember it used to be so long and, you know, I don't have time to really do this. But, um, you know, I think there's a misconception that it, it's, it's so time consuming. So actually there's only 10 questions and these are the questions that we go through and that we actually ask. We ask for your, ad, obviously your name, your address, your phone number, how many people are living in that address, the gender, age and date of birth, race, the Hispanic, Latino and Spanish origin question, whether a person is living somewhere else and obviously the relationship. So these are specifically um, what we ask. Before there used to be a long form and a short form. Um, so now it is just a simple 10 questions. The long form um, is now um, the American Community Survey. So um, we want to make sure that there is that distinction. Okay, so who should be counted? Um, everyone living at the residence on April 1st. So remember, this is going to be counting everybody. Um, everybody. It's a snapshot of the United States and it's five territories, so we want to make sure that one person should respond for each home. Um, that person must be at least 15 years or older, um, and they should live in the home or the place of residence themselves and know the general information about each person living there. If you have more questions on that, you can go on our 2020census.gov page um, under questions asked, and it does give you a little bit more information. Um, and then, Louise, could you give us a couple? Could you give us what kind of resources are, are available to help people in the self-response? Yeah, of course. Um, and so that's one of the biggest things we also get asked: uh, what uh, the resources that are available for people to be able to uh, help uh, self-respond. Um, one of the great, greatest resources that um, I've used on a couple of occasions to share with uh, my partners is the What is the 2020 Census uh, video that is available on YouTube. Uh, the great thing about the uh, video is that uh, it uh, has uh, language guides in 59 non-English languages and it goes uh, everything from the beginning of why we do the census um, uh, and then in, goes later on in, ter in terms of how people could potentially respond to the census if they wish to do so, but we'll go over that um, later in this uh, PowerPoint. Um, in addition to that, um, we have the paper language guides in 59 non-English languages, which also um, help and provide information in terms of uh, helping people be able to complete the census. Yeah, and I know so many of our partners, right, Luis, have used these um, language guides as uh, Census 101s because, you know, it, it really is a great document. I think it's like eight pages in total, but it really goes through um, a, a quick overview, of a couple quick facts of what the census is, and then it really goes into into the question. So, you know, there's no reason why people um, can go ahead and print off the first couple of pages and use that as a census 101 in all, all of these languages. Yep, that is a great idea. So the uh, uh, print language guide, uh, the print language guide is written in 59 non-English languages, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the guide is also available in uh, uh, large print and braille, uh, which is amazing because it allows us to be able to reach uh, a diverse uh, set of people throughout the United States and make sure that everybody gets counted. Um, each guide is about eight pages uh, and includes basic information about the 2020 census uh, and translations of the questions and response categories, which is amazing because, again, going back to the initial um, uh, aspect of, uh, of the uh, census, a lot of people want to know 
exactly what it, it's about and how it is that they can respond. Um, it's also, uh, I also wanted to mention that the ACOs carry the, the Braille guide, um, which is available to uh, the, our partners in the public if they wish to, to be able to grab some. Uh, the print language guides will also be available online and through uh, FLP, FLD partnership. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Yeah, if anybody wants to actually be able to see these, they, they, are, they are available right now on our 2020census.gov page. If you go ahead and click the search bar and type in language guides, you're actually um, taken to our language guide page, and you can see all of the various languages. You can see, um, you can open them up, go through them, see what they look like, um, and be able to bring up the PDF versions of everything and see kind of all the videos. So please familiarize yourself um, with our website, and um, if you get a chance, please go through and, and see what the language guides will look like. Okay, as we go through, um, we also have the paper form. So as we mentioned, there's three ways to respond. We're covering two of them. So the paper form um, will most likely be either mailed to your residence, in some cases dropped off if you're under the update leave category. Update leave is when our um, physical enumerators go out there and leave the, the questionnaire at your door and then um, update the address. So right now that is suspended um, due to COVID-19, but we will resume operations. Um, right now um, we have the date of April 15th, but um, most likely um, we just, I think it's about, I, I think next week is when we will start sending off all of the paper questionnaires to people who still have not responded to the census. So they are available in English and Spanish only. So um, a big thing is also do not collect and offer to mail forms for people. The postage is free. So we want to go ahead and empower people to go ahead and complete the census um, and mail it back, um, especially right now, you know, that people can complete the census with, you know, through the comfort of their own home. So as soon as they get that paper questionnaire, they can fill that out and, and mail that back. As we mentioned, the forms are available in Braille and large print, and you can request these at the um, ACO, so please reach out to your ACO. And then, um, Luis, do you want to go through some of the paper form instructions and, you know, what they can expect? Yeah, definitely. So all the mailing packages include a language assistance sheet with instructions in the 12 non-English languages. Um, you can see an example of it on the screen. I know it looks a little bit different. It's a little bit smaller, but you can find this online. Um, the instructions explain how to select the languages online and provide dedicated phone numbers for each non-English language. So it does have, in total, it's 13. So 12 plus English, so 13 languages, and it gives you all of the instructions as well. And then, Luis, do you want to go ahead and cover the bilingual paper forms available? Maybe we lost Luis, so we'll continue oh, okay. on. I'm back on. Uh, so yeah, so uh, on, in terms of the bilingual forms that are available, uh, so uh, there's uh, two great things that are going to happen. So the first one is households with Spanish tracts, which are um, uh, tracts or areas that uh, uh, have predominantly uh, English-speaking population. So these are going to be uh, in those areas which 20% of the occupants housing units have at least one adult who speaks Spanish or does not speak English very well. Um, so they're going to be receiving uh, all mailing materials in English and Spanish bilingual formats. In addition to that, house households in all other tracts will receive English materials that include a sentence in Spanish directing respondents to respond online or call uh, dedicated Spanish phone, a dedicated Spanish phone number. And that's uh, uh, in case we accidentally send somebody an English uh, form and uh, they're not able to complete it, they can have the information for them to be able to go online or call to be able to complete the Spanish, the, the census in Spanish. Absolutely. And I think, you know, being Spanish being, you know, the second largest or most popular language spoken in the United States, um, there's a wide range of, of resources available to them. So I know we've covered that in one of the other trainings, but want to make sure people know that um, 
the, the, by, the, the paper forms are bilingual in both Spanish and English. Okay, so um, a couple of do's. So please make sure um, a couple of tips are make sure you know how to get more information on about the questions on the help button. So please familiarize yourself with the questionnaire online. If you haven't, if you haven't yourself gotten a chance to respond to the census, um, go ahead and do it online through the um, internet self response option. That way you get a chance to see what it looks like. Um, it's fairly easy. I mean, I, I, I did it myself and I think it took me three minutes um, to fill out the information for myself and my husband. So it, it's very simple. Um, and it kind of gives you a good introduction. We're going to go through each screen a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, but like I said, if you haven't gotten a chance to do so or respond, you know, please, mm -hmm. please make sure you go on to um, our website and, and do the internet self response so you can get a little bit familiarized with what the page looks like. Um, you can read the questions if needed, if someone is asking you, you know, to read them. Um, and please, and you know, help others enter their answers of course, with their permission, that's, that's the big thing, um, making sure that, you know, as long as they give you your permission, you are good to go. A couple of don'ts, um, please don't suggest an answer or tell them what they should fill in, especially on the sex, race, and ethnicity question. For example, um, oh, you look white, so you should um, select this answer. Oh, you look Asian, so you should select this one. Oh, you look, you know, you, you're female, so please select this one. We want to make sure, um, you know, we help them but we do not fill them out for them or tell them what they should fill out. We want to empower people to self-identify um, and we can guide them through that, but we want to make sure we do not tell people what they should be responding. And then Luis, do you want to go through a couple of our, um, these scenarios for us? Yeah, definitely. Let's go through a couple of scenarios here. So the first scenario we have is a homeless person. Uh, so this includes couch surf surfers. Uh, if someone is homeless, they can still answer the census online. And this is really important because we get this question very often. Uh, there is an option uh, to submit the questionnaire without the address. Uh, they can enter some descriptive information about where they live. And so uh, majority of people that receive the invitation to complete the, cen the census uh, in the mail will have a code that uh, is connected to their address. However, a lot of people think that if they do not have this code, they cannot complete the census, but there is a way to be able to do so. Um, it just asks a couple extra more questions. And so it's important for, for everyone to know that even if someone is homeless or experiencing homelessness um, or are, are couch surfing, that they can still go um, online and, and complete the question, uh, the uh, census uh, online. Yeah, absolutely. Good point, Luis. And just so everybody knows, we are going to give you an example of what that screen looks like. Um, if you do click, you know that you do not have an address later on in the presentation. So just hold on tight for that um, and look, look for that a little bit further down on the training. All right, so scenario okay. number two. So uh, if somebody has a post, op post office box, will they be able to complete the census? Uh, well, if someone did not get a letter via the mail um, and has a PO box, they can uh, answer the online or they can answer online or call the toll-free uh, phone number. Um, again, everyone is going to be receiving uh, an invitation via mail to uh, uh, complete the census, uh, but some people, if they have a PO box, they, they may not be receiving uh, the invitation. They will need to enter their address on the form. Uh, there's also an option for the for rural addresses as well. So again, uh, there are options to be able to complete the census. And okay, uh, scenario number three. Oh, go ahead, Lisa. No, yeah, that'd be no. Please go ahead and go through okay. uh, scenario number three. I, I was just going to say, right. I think one one of the most popular questions we got was that PO box question. So mm -hmm. um, you know, please tell people that, you know, regardless of if they have a PO box, that they can still respond. Yeah, definitely. Um, and we do have a lot of uh, housing units that are in rural areas, and I think that's a really big concern for, for people that are not receiving the uh, invitation via mail. Um, so scenario number three, a disabled person. So it's important to note that, uh, uh, that individuals that may be blind or limited vision um, can still complete the census. We encourage them to call uh, the toll-free number. 
also physically disabled uh, individuals with a physical disability, uh, we encourage them to call the toll-free number as well. Um, a very important note that you can complete the online form for them uh, with their permission. All right, and scenario number four, so two homes. Um, so uh, answer, it's important for people to, that know that if they have two or more homes that they need to answer the question where they will live on April 1st or where, they, where you live the majority of the year. Um, and so this, this could potentially include uh, individuals that have, uh, uh, let's say, a cabin or a vacation home, um, wherever it is that you live majority of the year, that's where uh, the um, address where you're, that you're using to complete the census. Um, it's suggested that people, that the person call the toll-free number to complete the, the form or noti notify the Census Bureau that the second home is vacant uh, just because uh, that, that uh, other home with the other homes will also be receiving an invitation to complete the census. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this really helps our operations team, um, you know, just giving them a heads up that they can at least make a note that that second home will be vacant um, so they don't need to send, you know, a physical enumerator out there um, when they know that the, the main homeowners are responding at their, at their other home, at their primary home. Okay, so now as we get through um, the internet self-response portion, um, we do want to note that um, the portal was open March 12th, and it is, um, you know, extended all the way to August. So if anybody, you know, has any questions that they can respond, uh, if they can respond now, please let them know that the Internet Self-Response um, portal is open. So please, please, please go online and respond now. Okay. Um, we do have a couple of step-by-step -step guides for internet self-response. I know, um, you know, previous to this shelter in place, we did have a couple of our partners who were saying that um, they were going to play these videos on a loop um, in, his, in their location. So the video shows an introduction on how people can respond to the portal. It's really helpful. It's available in all of the following languages. So English, Spanish, Cantonese, Mandarin, both simplified and traditional. Vietnamese, Polish, Arabic, Korean, Tagalog, Russian, French, Japanese, Portuguese, and Haitian Creole. So all of these languages, um, we can pull up the video. Um, as you see on the screen, it's about a six to seven minute video that has the information on a uh, step-by-step on how you can respond to the census um, via the online portal. So, you know, if, if after this training you still have more questions, please make sure that you go online to our YouTube channel and get a chance to um, go, go ahead and watch the step-by-step -step portion. It goes over the same things that we're going to go over shortly um, in a very nice way. Yeah, and it is an amazing video because it goes through every single one of the questions, basically what we're going to be doing here uh, in a little bit, but uh, they do an amazing job of uh, going through um, all of the process of being able to fully complete the census. Yeah, and then um, so a couple of helpful tips. So um, it's important to note, you know, do not use a web browser button. Um, to go back and forward, use the buttons in the questionnaire. So um, I think to know, and you know, Luis, I'm sure you can, um, you know, also give a couple of good tips on here. Is it'll actually kick you off of the questionnaire when you use the browser buttons. So please try to use the buttons in the questionnaire, and, and it gives you that information a little bit more um, as we go through. Once we go through the actual demonstration, you'll be able to see where it has the back and forward button. Okay, um, and then for the internet self-response, um, this, this is a, a little snapshot of what the web page, what the main page looks like. As I said, we're going to go through more in detail once we do the demonstration. But you can actually toggle between all the languages, so in total the, the 12 non-English languages, um, at the drop-down language menu. So you can actually, actually gives you two options. So um, there's a, it looks like a world icon. And on that globe, you can actually click on that globe and pick the language that you'd like to go ahead and respond. Or where you have the yellow um, arrows, you can actually 
see that the, the, all the languages are available at the top of the screen as well as at the bottom of the screen. So anytime throughout your Internet Self-Response questionnaire that you're filling this out, you can actually toggle through all of these language options. So say if you clicked, an, you know, you clicked um, a language on accident, um, you're not stuck um, you know, that, with that language. You can actually toggle through, even while you're filling out the questionnaire, through all of these languages and the entire page will translate. So, so please make sure that you, you're aware of um, before you start the questionnaire, you have that option of going ahead and, and selecting what, what language you'd like to respond and whatever you're most comfortable with. That's awesome, uh, Lisette. And uh, what, what, what would you suggest I do if uh, my language is not part of the uh, 12 non-English uh, languages that are in the drop-down? I would definitely say, you know, go ahead and pull up a language guide. So if you have, you know, if you need, if you have it printed or you, you feel comfortable doing it, you know, having maybe two, two screens open, um, I would make sure I pull up that language guide. So for example, let's say, um, I, another, you know, I don't know off the top of my head which one aren't, isn't listed, but um, please pull up our language guide, well, as we mentioned, and, and gave you a quick um, introduction on them a little bit earlier on in the slides. Um, there are about eight pages, and they literally go, you know, what each question will be. So you can go ahead and answer, um, you know, look at the question on the screen, maybe in English, but you can read it in your native language on the language guide and know exactly which button you should push. Um, so you do have some flexibility and some option. And if not, I would say, you know, if you feel if you don't feel comfortable, maybe asking someone for help as well. That's awesome. And uh, where, where could I get a language guide? Yeah. So please make sure you can um, you can always ask you know the local ACO um, for that information. But you can you can actually go and download it yourself on our 2020census.gov page. So as I mentioned, if you go to 2020census.gov and you type in language guide on the search button, you can, it will take you directly to our language guide page. Um, our entire page actually translates when you click on a couple of these languages. So please make sure you check that out and you would be able to download it. It's all in a PDF, so it's free uh, and available for everybody to use. Awesome. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, just a couple uh, more helpful tips uh, that we have here to ensure that you um, have a great experience completing the census online. I think uh, um, it's important for you to note that if a question is skipped, uh, you will be prompted to answer. Um, people always ask us, I, I know, Lisette, you get this question, I know I get it all the time, whether um, it's okay for people to skip a question. Um, we definitely would like for everyone to complete the census as fully as possible in order for us to be able to have the best um, uh, results in terms of the data that we're collect collecting. Um, but if uh, you click on the uh, uh, next to continue uh, without answering, uh, that's definitely an option that people could have um, um, if, if they don't feel like answering a question. Yeah, I think like like you said, I think this is one of the, the one of the question most popular questions that we we get always asked. You know, can we skip these questions? And as Louise said, um, we want to make sure to encourage and promote everybody to to respond to to the questionnaire to to their fullest extent. You know, try to have the most complete information. Um, but we know there are a lot of um, concerns out there um, for different populations. So just keep all of that in mind when you're helping people fill this out, that you might get this question. Um, and you have to make sure, you, you know, you have to validate, don't dismiss um, some of their fears and some concerns, listen to them, and just go ahead and explain, you know, that all the information that we do have and that, that we do collect is protected by Title 13, specifically around confidentiality, um, and just make sure you, you give them the, the information. I think that's one of the biggest reasons why people, um, you know, usually skip a question. So I think once we give them a little bit more background information on all, you know, the laws that are in place, how it's very clear, um, I think that makes them feel a, a lot better, right? Yeah, no, of course. Okay, and I think the, the page is just lagging a little bit, so there we go. Awesome. Okay, let me go uh, to this next helpful tip uh, because we love giving helpful tips. Um, the online questionnaire will um, actually time you out after 15 minutes of inactivity. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're on top of it. Once you open the, 
the uh, uh, online portal to complete the census, the best thing to do is to be able to complete the census in one sitting. Uh, because after 15 minutes, uh, people will have to uh, actually uh, start all over again. Um, so we don't want people um, having to uh, get frustrated um, if, if they're in the process of completing the census and they, ha they have to leave for some reason. Uh, we want to encourage people to try to complete it in one sitting in order for them not to have to restart. Yeah, of course. So if you, depending on, you know, um, please make sure you allow, depending on how big your family is, you know, if you have a family of five, um, please allow enough time that you, you you have enough time to fill out all of these 10 questions for everybody in your family. So just make sure you're prepared for that. Okay. So um, getting started. So this is what the main page looks like. So. This is kind of when we're walking into more of the demo side of, of this part of the training. So all of these are snippets of, of the online questionnaire portion. So, um, you know, it's not live, but you can go ahead and get a good sense and an idea of what the internet self response um, portal looks like. Um, and as you said, if you have any further questions or you want to see kind of more of a live demo or anything else that maybe we might have missed, um, you can always go to the step-by-step um, video that we have on our YouTube channel that guides you. That's a six minute video that um, will go kind of, that will cover everything that we will cover in this training. So you will see it's the my2020census.gov. You see the start questionnaire and then you do see um, the welcome. It gives you a quick information and a quick introduction about how this is safe, secure, and confidential. Um, your privacy is protected. The page is also encrypted. So usually at the top, you do see a lock icon that says that this is an encrypted page. It also will have an flag um, icon that says this is a United States government website. Um, so that also will help you know that, um, you know that this is an actual government page. Um, it does let you also know that, you know, how the importance of the 2020 census and how this, your response really helps your community in directing billions of dollars, you know, for schools and roads and other public services. Um, it also is um, directly affects your political representation, both in the state level as well as in Congress. But more importantly, you know, the census information is used to distribute each, um, all the seats in Congress for each state. So we want to make sure everybody is empowered to respond as it does affect us for the next 10 years. Anything else you want to add before we move on, Lee? Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's also a getting started section, uh, which uh, shares some information that, that we already uh, shared with you guys in the, in the helpful tips. Um, again, you must be able to complete the census, uh, uh, your questionnaire once you begin. Uh, we don't want people having to restart or start all over uh, because they, they uh, left their computers uh, for a second. Um, and also, uh, it's, it's very important that people don't use the back forward uh, um, on the, in the browser and that they use the navigations in the uh, questionnaire. Um, and last but not least, uh, for best results, uh, using the latest versions of Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, or Safari, um, and enable cookies, there's a possibility that if your cookies are not enabled or if you, you, you're using an outdated uh, version, it might not let you open uh, the uh, questionnaire. Yeah, good point. Okay. So. Okay. Um, do you want to go ahead and give us um, a quick step-by-step -step on how they get started once you are on the login page? Yeah, in the login page, the first section of the login page is the uh, address verification. Um, and this is the section where you use your 12-digit census ID uh, that you received in your uh, invitation letter uh, um, to be able to uh, 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 match that with your with your home address. And so uh, the uh, address ID, the, the 12 digit number you can put into the uh, boxes and then you click login. Um, in addition to that, um, as we mentioned previously, there's a possibility that you may um, have forgotten the login ID at home or you uh, might have uh, uh, tossed it by accident or again, if uh, you're experiencing homelessness or um, are couch surfing that you um, um, are able to click on if you do not have the census ID, click here um, option. Um, and uh, we can um, 
we can go into a little bit of details uh, in regards to that just because uh, it's important for, for people to know that they can complete the uh, census without the uh, login ID. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just um, as I mentioned, as we mentioned in the previous slides, um, you can actually see, um, and I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but you can actually see all of the languages available down below. So I um, want to make sure we point that out, as we mentioned that a couple of um, earlier in the slides, so um, you can always toggle through all of those, and then you know if you do not have that census ID here, um, you make sure you click that that button. We did get a question saying you know, they access the website if they're visiting another country, such as Canada or you know let's say Mexico. Unfortunately, you cannot. You know our our, our system is so you can you, you can um, only respond to it while you're in the U.S. All right, so helpful okay. tips. Uh, uh, again, using your login ID um, for your, from your invitation letter helps to speed up the process uh, to be able to uh, match your ID with your home address. Uh, but again, you can also complete your questionnaire without your ID, uh, but it will, you will need to answer a few uh, more questions. And so we could uh, um, let's take a look at the screen of um, how it looks like if you uh, do not have a login ID. Yeah, so here we go to the address verification as, as, as Luis mentioned. So if you don't have an ID, you will go, um, this is the question that you will get, that will get prompted. So in order to collect your address, they're going to want to first know where you're going to be living on April 1st, 2020. So these are your three options. You know, you can live in a U.S. state or the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, or somewhere else. If you have any questions or need help, there's the help button on the right-hand side, so please make sure you also click on that if you want a little bit more information. So we're going we're gonna to say, you know, a U.S. state, let's say, um, you know, maybe California or Nevada, Oregon, et cetera. So we're going to hit U.S. state, and then you're going to get prompted to this question. It says, where will you be living on April 1st, 2020? And it does give you a little bit of information. So it does say provide the street address you will use to have a package delivered directly to your residence, not a rural route or a PO box address used for mailing purposes. So the street address is the most helpful for processing your response. So it does give you an example. So let's say it's 101 North Main Street, apartment 23, um, and you know you type in your city, the state, and the zip code. And that's what we, that's what really helps us ensure that we get the correct, the we get the correct um, address for you. And it does, but it does give you that option, as we mentioned, that let's say you are experiencing homelessness or you, you don't have a usual home, you would put, I do not have a street address. And then it will take you over um, to a couple of other slides. Right now, um, it, this is just before we move on. The help button is located on the top right corner. So if you do have, you know, have any questions, as I mentioned, please make sure you click that for um, a little bit more descriptive information. So a little bit more on the explanation for the address question. So as soon as you click help, this is what will pop up. So it does say, um, you know, if you have more than one address associated with your residence, please provide the address. Um, the street address if available. Um, if you usually are, have a PO box or a rural route address for mailing purposes, enter the physical address. Some PO boxes look like street address, but are actually the addresses for private mailbox at a business or a post office. So we just want to make sure that we get the street address of where you will be living or staying on April 1st. So um, this is just an example of where it says for street address such as this, you can enter that in the address field. So just a, a couple of a little bit more of additional descriptive information um, when you do hit that help button. And it does, it does give you um, these type of, of information and descriptions you know, throughout the entire process. So, you know, if you're confused or, you know, have a little bit of extra question, you know, more questions or follow-ups or you didn't really understand the question, please make sure you hit the help button um, because it does go into a bit more in depth on each question on what, why we're asking and what specifically, how we want you to respond. That is a great tool. So some additional okay. questions uh, about your address. Uh, two extra questions that uh, will be prompted is, uh, do you have a rural address? Um, so in this location, you could either select yes or no. 
Um, and then additional to that, um, it will ask you if uh, you will be experiencing uh, homelessness on April 1st, 2020. Um, this is uh, important and we can go into a little bit more detail on the next slide uh, on homelessness. So homeless people um, uh, are asked to provide information about where they are staying. Um, so it has the option to input a city, a state, and a zip code. Um, and then at the, at the bottom, it has an additional box um, where uh, uh, individuals experiencing homelessness could uh, uh, most accurately try to describe uh, where it is they're going to be staying uh, on April 1st. Um, that can be anything like uh, the brick house uh, with the screen porch on the north, northeast uh, corner uh, of a particular road. Um, it can be a park, um, it, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. We, we want to have them try to describe a little bit uh, more in, in details in terms of where they say they're going to be located um, if they will be uh, experiencing homelessness on April 1st. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's great that it has, you know, um, an in, uh, a box that you can actually type in and really elaborate a little bit more information. Um, so it does, you know, you don't just have to type in just the city and the state and the zip code. You, you can really elaborate and provide a little bit more information on where exactly you'll be living. Yeah, um, again, census's goal is to try to get the most accurate information. And so that's why um, we ask these questions to try to be able to uh, gather um, as much information as we can to be able to have uh, an accurate and complete census. Um, so moving on yeah. to the part two uh, section, um, we have uh, a couple of questions that are uh, um, dictated to asking household questions. Uh, the first uh, screen shows um, boxes to be able to input a name uh, and a telephone number. Uh, so uh, you would uh, include your first, middle, and last name and uh, telephone number. Um, Lisette, why do why would they ask me for my telephone number? Yeah, good question. So, you know, the Census Bureau asks for your phone number in case there are any questions about your census form. We will only contact you for official census business if needed. Um, so please try to just complete the census as, as much as, you know, to the best of your ability and as complete as possible. Um, you know, it's usually if something, you know, if your, your, your questionnaire really looks off that, you know, just something really doesn't make sense that we, we would, that's the only reason that would prompt us, you know, to, to ask you some questions about your census form. Okay, awesome. That is great to know. Yeah, and um, and like like we said, just try to go ahead and complete it as much as possible. Um, we do get the question if if we, some questions can be skipped, and like we mentioned earlier, yes, you can skip some questions. You will get prompted, but we want to make sure you can complete it at least to the best of your ability. And as we move forward um, to the rest of the household questions, you're going to get, you're going to see something um, just like the screen for the icon of the house that says, you know, next you're going to be asked some questions about the household. So please press start to begin. And we're going to hit start. And then it goes into this, how many people are living at this resident, uh, at this residence? So including yourself, how many people will be living or staying at, and then I'll say um, your address that you typed in. For example, I use this one um, here in Washington. So if you need more information, remember to always click for more information, include here, and you would type in the number of people total that are living at that residence. Um, it is important to note that you can actually um, type in up to 99 people, um, you know, if that's what you would like to, to go ahead and include. You're gonna get, then you're gonna get this follow-up question that says, what is the name of each person who will be living or staying at blank street? So where, you know, wherever you are, your, your residence. Um, so you will enter the name, um, and then, for example, you would have already listed your name, so let's say Jane Doe, so it already has Jane Doe, and then you will enter, consequently, you know, um, down below all of the people who are living in that house. So let's say you put three people. If you, then you go ahead and put in John Doe, and then you would put, add another person, and then fill out that information for everybody um, living in that household. Hey, Lisa, can I include my 99 cats uh, on the census? 
You know, as much as, um, you know, I know pets are very important and they are part of the family, we want to make sure you are only including, um, you know, human beings that are living with you in the census. So um, I would say not for this, not, not, not for this census. <laughs> okay, do we note it? Okay. Um, as we move as we move forward before I um, turn it in to, um, turn it over to Luis, we want we do want to make sure that you know no is anyone missing so we want to make sure no one is missed um, for example and then we do give a couple of examples we want to make sure you didn't miss any children whether they're related to you or unrelated so newborn babies grandchildren foster children um, any relatives uh, maybe you have you know your aunt and your cousin living there, and maybe their two kids are living with you as well because, you know, maybe they're in between jobs. Or maybe you have, you know, a multi-generational family where, you know, the grandparents are living with them as well, and maybe um, your son and your daughter's kids are living with you as well. So let's make sure, you know, we count everybody who is staying at your home, regardless if they're related to you or they're not. Or not. We want to make sure we include everybody. It's a complete count of everybody staying at that home address. So um, it, it gives you a reminder, these are the people you listed so far, so Jane Doe and John Doe. And then it says, is there gonna be any additional people that you did not already list? And then it does go into yes or no. And then if you need more information, it does in include that link for you as well. Okay, and then it does go into the rent and the own question. So it does say, Rent or own, so you're asked, you know, on April 1st, will the house or apartment or mobile home um, at 123 Main Street be owned by you or by someone else um, with a mortgage loan, mortgage or loan, sorry, um, owned by you or someone in this household free and clear, rented or occupied without rent? So usually, you know, we ask this question, we usually ask this question because it helps produce um, statistics about home ownership and renting. The rates of home ownership serve as an indicator of the nation's economy. They also help with administering housing programs, planning, and decision making at all level of government. Um, so that's why we ask this question. I know this is something that usually a lot of people say, um, you know, why, why specifically are you asking us this? So that's just an example. I think, um, I think off the top of my head, I had read somewhere that it said that, um, you know, compared to 20 years ago, um, the average home ownership age now in the United States is about 46. So that just goes to show, you know, how much things have changed around home ownership um, and when people are buying a home now than maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, and then, okay, so you wanna go ahead and, um, Go ahead and take over part three and all of the people questions. People questions, all right. People questions are my favorite. So let's go into a little bit of uh, detail in terms of people questions. So uh, depending on how many people that you included um, in the, the household questions and who's living uh, um, in your household, uh, we will have uh, questions that are going to be asked for each, each individual. So here we have uh, Jane Doe and uh, John Doe, and we're gonna ask a couple of questions uh, about them. And so uh, the first question we're going to be asking is a sex question. And so uh, in this particular example, he asks whether, uh, uh, what uh, is Jane Doe's uh, sex? Uh, and the options that we have on there are male or female. Uh, once you click next, the next question that uh, comes up is the age, of, uh, age and date of birth uh, uh, question and so uh, first uh, option asks uh, what is uh, Jane Doe's uh, date of birth and it has the uh, uh, option to be able to put uh, month, day, and year. Um, if uh, for any reason you do not know uh, the date of birth, um, there is an option to be able to click here to give you a little bit more information. Um, and then uh, further down, um, it asks you to be able to verify um, uh, and enter the correct age um, as of April 1st, 2020. Um, for babies less than one year, uh, do not enter the age and month, uh, just enter a zero. And so we use the, this uh, two-part method to try to be able to get the best and most accurate information in regards to uh, people's uh, uh, age and um, uh, to be able to have the best information as of April 1st. 
All right, so let's uh, talk a little bit more about the sex question. So uh, um, with a lot of these, these questions that are asked in uh, the people question section, um, we get a lot of questions from our partners or from community uh, uh, personnel in regards to why these questions are being asked. So it's always great for us to be able to go over uh, some history of some of these questions. So um, the sex question has actually been asked uh, since uh, 1790. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the sex question is part of the census bill um, to be able to um, provide uh, important statistical information um, as it states on here, uh, response to the assessment questions provide a snapshot of the nation. And so it's uh, important for us to be able to ask these questions to be able to get the most accurate information. Um, so responding to the sex question is easy and the question of sex has been included since, as I mentioned, since the 1790. And uh, the 2020 census question uh, that involved personal characters are based on self-identification. Uh, when you complete your census, select box uh, up for the sex you identify with. Uh. Yeah, absolutely. And just, in, I mean, in general, it just helps us, like like Louise said, create statistics about males and females. Um, and overall, all of these questions really help us, um, you know, in planning and funding for government programs um, to enforce laws and regulations and, policy, and in policies against discrimination. Okay, so as we move forward. Okay, um, this just gives a little bit more information, uh, you know, sex versus gender. Um, like we said, um, you know, uh, the 2020 census questions are just intended to capture your current biological sex, but we want to make sure, um, you know, people, respondents should answer um, either male or female based on their own current identification. So it's, we want to make sure people know that they are empowered um, so they can self-identify. Okay, and then for age, um, I know Luis um, covered this a little bit before, um, but we do ask um, the question of age and um, date of birth um, to understand the size and the characteristics of different age groups. Um, and then um, overall, we use this to create statistics and to better understand every, um, all of these groups. Agencies, like I said, use this data to plan and fund um, government programs um, that support specific age, age groups, including children um, and older adults. Okay, awesome. Luis, do you want to tell us why you asked both age and date of birth? Yeah, I uh, went over it uh, a little bit. Um, earlier, but uh, just a bit more information in terms of why we asked uh, two questions instead of just one. Um, so as I mentioned uh, previously, providing information both age and date of birth significantly increases the accuracy uh, of the data. So we want to make sure that um, we're trying to uh, uh, compare both, uh, both of the answers to try to be able to get the uh, accurate information. Um, in, in addition to that, there's, all, there's often a confusion about the reference uh, date uh, in the age question. Um, so, uh, date of birth provides an important check uh, on respondents' understanding. Um, again, this, this is uh, um, age as of April, uh, April 1st, 2020. Um, in electronic instruments, uh, when we ask the date uh, first, it actually calculates the age and we ask for uh, response to be able to confirm that. Um, and uh, response should not guess the date of birth. Um, so if uh, the date of birth is not known, uh, they should provide an estimate of the age and, um, and they'll only provide uh, date of birth information they know. So we, we want to make sure that people are not guessing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and overall, I know I, I know we get a lot of questions like, what if people don't, you know, what if I don't identify as either, you know, male or female? Um, you know, should I leave the question blank? Um, or if someone's in transition between genders, we want to make sure to empower people to let um, them decide, um, you know, what they most self-identify is, and, you know, and if they don't feel comfortable, yes, they have the option to leave it blank, um, but we want to just encourage them to, to self-identify and complete as much as, as of the questionnaire as possible. Wow, that is, that okay. is great to know. Yeah, and as we move on, um, we do get the Hispanic or we move on to the um, Hispanic origin question, which you will receive. So um, please note that both um, question eight of, of, um, is about Hispanic origin and then um, question nine is about race. So we'll go into both of these um, in the next few slides. 
Um, so it, it does say, you know, is Jane Doe of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin? So it does give you a couple of options. And you can click more than one. So say you um, self-identify as more than, more than one of these, um, you know, a lot of people who are, you know, mixed or, or um, feel like, you know, maybe they, they identify as um, both Puerto Rican maybe but, and Colombian. They can actually say, you know, yes to another Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin, and they can actually type that in um, into the into the box and really give um, good information on on that way we can create statistics on each of these um, um, Spanish origins as well. O overall, um, we'll go we'll go over this a little bit more, uh, but you know, these responses really help create statistics about the um, ethnic group, and it helps federal agencies monitor the compliance with anti-discrimination um, provisions such as those in the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. All right, so a uh, little bit more information on the Hispanic origin. Uh, so again, people always want to know how long these questions have been asked uh, to make sure, um, uh, or they, they're just curious in terms of how, how long these questions have been around uh, on the census. Uh, the uh, Hispanic origin uh, question has been around since the 1970s. Um, and uh, uh, this question is used to create statistical uh, statistics about the, the ethnic groups, whether somebody is Hispanic, Latino, or of Spanish, Spanish origin. Um, and it really helps to, um, it helps federal agencies uh, monitor compliance with, uh, with anti-discrimination provisions. Uh, uh, whether it's a uh, voting, voting Rights Act or the Civil Rights Act. And so it's important for people to be able to uh, fully respond to these questions in order for us to be able to have accurate information. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, do you want to give us a little bit more information um, on the race? On yeah. The question? Mm -hmm. So the race question, um, uh, this particular example, it's asking about uh, what is uh, Jane, Jane Doe's race. Um, and so uh, select one or more uh, boxes and enter origins. Uh, so, you know, you can definitely select uh, uh, more than one box um, on, on this. Uh, first uh, selection is white. Um, it gives a couple examples um, uh, who falls under that category. And then the next one is black or Afri African American. And it also gives a bit, a uh, few more examples in terms of who falls under uh, that category. Um, yeah, and a couple then, uh, other uh, race questions uh, that are included in terms of options for people to be able to uh, select. Uh, we have uh, American Indian or Alaskan Native. Um, uh, and again, there's a, a brief descriptions of who falls under that category. Um, there's also Chinese, Filipino, uh, Asian, Indian, Vietnamese, Korean, Japanese, or other Asian. Um, and again, they also uh, have an um, option to be able to input there. Uh, Native Haw uh, Hawaiian, Samoan, Chamorro, um, or the Pacific Islander. And again, if somebody does not fall within any of those race categories, it, it, uh, it's very helpful that it has uh, a some other category uh, text box for people to uh, uh, input with what it is they identify with uh, in terms of their race. Yeah, absolutely. I think the big thing, um, you have a, a wide range of options. Um, you know, and you can click more than one. Um, but like Luis mentioned, we want to make sure people feel empowered that they can self-identify. Um, we, we, we do not want to tell them that they should fill, you know, they look like this, so they should fill in this box. It's whatever they self-identify as. Okay, so why we ask the race question. So the race question has actually been asked in 1790. Um, um, just like the other questions, um, you know, um, the census collects this basic information on, on age, sex, Hispanic origin, and race for every person in the household, but it really is, um, and it allows us to create statistics about race and analyze other statistics within racial groups. So this data helps federal agencies monitor the compliance with anti-discrimination provisions, such as those in the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. So it goes through a little bit more of information if you have any other um, questions about, you know, race and ethnicity or age and sex, um, please go on our 2020census.gov website for more information. So as we move forward, um, you can continue answering all of these questions. Um, we just went through one example, but you'd, you'd do this for everybody um, who's living in that household. So then we just finished Jane Doe, so now we'd move on to John Doe. And we'd do the same thing and we'd hit start. 
and then continue to answer all of these same questions, um, you know, for, the, for all of the people living in that household. Okay. Luis, do you want to tell us about, you know, the relationship question? Yeah, so uh, the first person who whoever is completing the, the census does not, does not have a relationship question. Uh, these uh, relationship questions are uh, in terms of anybody else that is included as part of living under the household. Um, so uh, the person that is uh, completed, completing the, the census uh, is John Doe, and so John Doe is uh, asking, uh, answering a question in terms of uh, Jane Doe. Um, and so the, uh, the uh, relationship question um, is asking uh, what is the relation between John Doe and Jane Doe, um, and uh, has very different, very various different uh, options in order for people to be able to select um, what the relationship relationship between uh, the person completing the census and those other people living um, in that household is uh, again to be able to get uh, as much uh, accurate information as we possibly can uh, about the people that are living uh, within that household. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, it goes through a, a, a wide range of scenarios. Um, you know that people might have, um, but really, this really allows us allows the Census Bureau to develop data about families and households and all these other groups. Um, all this relationship data is so important just because it is used for planning and funding um, for government programs that support these families. Um, like for example, when you're raising, you know. Um, Children alone, um, you you do, you do um, now. We have statistics um, to be able to help plan for those programs. So as we move forward, then we get to part four, which is the final question. Um, so say we've already got done, we've already answered all of these questions for Jane Doe, for John Doe, um, and then we get to this 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 notification where it says final questions. So we go ahead and hit start, and then it says it's another it's a you know our quality control question to make sure you know who is missing let's make sure that you did not um, miss anybody and we want to make sure everyone is only counted once so some people live or stay in more than one place so this is also a question we get a lot so um, you know maybe your your mom is um, in a nursing home or let's say you have your child who is um, away attending college so, and you, you didn't know if you should include them in the census. This is really, maybe you did include them, but it gives you, um, you know, this, this question that says, okay, um, for example, you know, um, does, do any of these people usually live or stay somewhere else? So let's use the example of someone attending college. So let's say your child is off, you know, at college and you listed them. Um, let's say it's John Doe. So you would click John Doe, and then you would say, um, the next question would say, okay, why are they away? And then you would put, you know, because they are attending college. So it really, it gives us an, an op, um, the information um, if there was a duplicate count, because people who are attending colleges or, you know, are in another group home or a jail, they are counted under a separate operation, which is called group quarters. So group quarters is when we go ahead and count um, institutions or locations that are administered, um, you know, for people who are not related but are living in the same housing unit. So we count them a little bit differently. So this is just to make sure we count everybody only once. Uh, what about uh, what about kids? Um, I heard, or specifically babies. I heard there was a, a large undercount of babies. Um, are, are they often missed uh, on the census or? or um, what, what's the, what was the confusion with babies in, in 2010? Yeah, absolutely. Great point, Louise. So yeah, in 2010, there was a large undercount of, of young children, um, specifically between the ages of zero to five. So, um, you know, we did a study on, on what that reason was. And, you know, if it was one reason, um, we would have solved that already. It's multiple reasons. Um, I think there's misconceptions that the census was only applied to adults. Um, you know, if there was a multi-generational family, a lot of children were missed. Um, you know, if parents were divorced, um, maybe mom assumed that dad was counting and dad assumed that mom was counting and then the child was missed completely. Um, and maybe they were, you know, a foster child or they didn't have legal guardianship or custody of them. So maybe that child was living with their grandmother, but legally, you know, she didn't have any, um, you know, any custody over him, so she didn't know that she could claim him. So there was a large, large, um, you know, undercount of young children. We want to make sure people know that, um, you know, regardless of, you know, the legal, legal custody or, you know, it's whoever is living at that household. So please make sure you count everybody who is living um, in that house on April 1st. So, you know, regardless of relationship, um, or, you know, if they're related to you or if they're not, or if they're only 
staying with you, um, you know, for, you know, a, half the year, um, but not maybe permanently. We want to make sure we count everybody um, in that household. Um, you know, it's, it's very important. Um, specifically for young children, it's the first 10 years of their life. So, you know, by, by for the next census, if a child is a newborn, they'll be 10 years old. That's the most critical first 10 years of their life where they'll be missing out on critical resources um, and funding for all of their programs, especially um, schools and you know, nutrition assistance programs that are so important to them. Well, that's great information. Uh, what about my baby cats? Did you say your baby cat? My baby cats. <laughs> no, um, unfortunately, you know, um, don't include them in the census. Like, like we said, we want to make sure we're living, we're counting every, um, you know, human being living um, in the United States. Um, so not for this one, but um, like we said, maybe you can, maybe you can create your own census, um, you know, for your household <laughs> and include them okay. in those. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying really hard yeah. to count my cats. Yes, yes, you know, like I said, we want to make sure, you know, we're just counting everybody, but um, only once and in the right place. Um, and if you have any other questions of whether or not you should include someone, you can go on their 2020census.gov page um, and you go, you visit um, who to count, and that gives you a little bit of information on who you should be counting. Um, we also have a residency criteria that really goes into more information um, on, you know, who should be the who should be counting and all of these situational housing questions that that most people can encounter. Awesome. Okay. All right. Do you want to go ahead and uh, finish the talk? Yeah, we get to uh, the final screen. So um, it's really great because it's this uh, final screen. It gives you the option to um, either submit your questionnaire or edit the question uh, questionnaire. Um, uh, you know, if if uh, you realize that once you get to the end of the questionnaire, you realize that you, you missed something or uh, you didn't fully answer a question or um, let's say uh, uh, in the age uh, uh, date of birth question, you now remember uh, your, uh, your wife or spouse's uh, date of birth. Um, you can go back and input it there to ensure that you don't get a question or uh, a call from the census and get in trouble for not knowing uh, his or her uh, date of birth. And so um, once you get to the screen, um, you could uh, um, hit, uh, submit uh, uh, your questionnaire and uh, you will be finished. And one last uh, tip that uh, we wanted to include on here is, as we mentioned in the beginning, that there are uh, uh, encryptions, uh, that uh, the data um, that is being collected is encrypted. And so there are protocols in place to, in, in order to ensure that all the, the responses of the census are protected. Um, this is really important because, uh, you know, people want to make sure, uh, want to feel like the, uh, their answers are secure and safe, um, especially be with, a, um, with a, a being able to, or navigating the internet, whether it's uh, through computer or on the phone, uh, they want to make sure that their information is being protected and it's not, it's not going to um, um, places it's not supposed to. Um, and so um, we, we make it very clear that all of uh, the data that is uh, being collected from the census is, is indeed encrypted and protected. Yeah, absolutely. Just like you mentioned, Luis, um, you know, the security of the Census um, Bureau system is always a top priority for us and for our key team and our infrastructure. Um, you know, we, we, we make sure to defend, you know, the, the infrastructure against, um, you know, any cyber threats and we continually work to refine our approach to identify and prevent and detect um, all of these threats to ensure that, you know, um, we, your information is protected. And as we get to the last page, um, you will get a confirmation page. Um, it does say thank you for completing the 2020 census. Um, it does give you your address that you submitted, the date you completed it, the, the time in Eastern Standard Time. Um, and then if you do get any other mail from us, maybe a reminder, but we have maybe already mailed it out, you know, two to three days ago, please, please disregard it. Um, the mail, like I said, we might have already mailed it out before you completed this. Um, and if you have any questions, we do provide a phone number for that one eight four four in the phone number that's printed. Um, it's also printed in your materials, but we include it as well. So if, if you have any questions um, or maybe you completely forgot to add someone else, you can always call our toll-free phone number um, for more additional questions. And then it does have a confirmation number. So you can go ahead and either print that or save the screen. Um, you know, um, I think for, for myself, I, I print everything off. I think 
I'm, I, I like to hoard things a little bit to make sure things were completed. So I would probably I would probably print this um, screen off just to make sure that if anybody um, you know had any questions, I had my confirmation page that said I did complete my census, and our everybody in our household, um, you know, we, we make sure to, to to respond to it. And that is it. Any other questions um, that we might have? Or Luis, do you have any, any final thoughts um, for everybody in today's webinar? No. Um, hopefully we, we were able to answer uh, all of the questions that everybody had um, in terms of the census. Uh, I think one last thing I wanted to uh, just add on here is um, uh, in the age question, it stated that uh, to uh, complete this, the question based off of uh, April 1st, um, and again, that goes for everything else as well, um, including uh, the, the home address uh, um, uh, question or uh, whatever it may be, uh, make sure, making sure that the census is being completed based off of uh, information uh, as of April 1st. Uh, that's really important. For first, the census date, which uh, uh, just passed, um, and uh, that's kind of the, the um, date that we're using to be able to uh, get uh, accurate, accurate information for the census. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think just final thoughts is um, overall, you know, it's never been easier to respond um, all from, you know, the comfort of your own home. You have three different ways to respond. We went over two of them today and, you know, these results um, will really determine how, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in federal funding will flow into your communities every year, really for the next decade. So we want to make sure that you feel empowered and um, empowered for you to respond and empowered to um, empower others how um, these responses will really shape um, funding, you know, for every aspect of different communities, no matter the size and no matter the location. So we want to thank you again for joining us in today's webinar. Um, if you have any additional questions, please reach out to your local ACO or to your partnership specialist um, so you can, um, we can expand on anything that was covered in today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for attending today's session. The recording will now stop.